Um, so we're going to keep it going. Um, you guys have a full day ahead of you, um, and so we're going to just keep the program going. Um, we're going to head right into our dynamic workforce panel. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from Idaho employers now. We're going to start to hear a little bit about how this is impacting employers in your backyard, uh, what they're seeing, what their needs are, how these things are impacting what's going on in terms of the age of agility in their own workforces. So um, we're passing out some note cards right now. So there'll be note cards in front of all of you. Um, this gives you an opportunity to jot down a question. Um, after we have each of the members of the Dynamic Workforce panel come up, they will each do kind of a lightning, uh, a lightning talk. So they're going to give you a very brief introduction about who they are, a few comments. Um, we're going to go through each of the members of the panel, and then we're going to bring them up together we're going to have a moderator, we're going to have a few kickoff questions, and then the questions go to you. So use those note cards, fill out a question, um, you can hold them up, we're going to be circulating the room, but after you get a flavor for um, their content, their approach, uh, make sure you, you jot down some questions. So um, with that, we're going to start with Trent Clark from Bear. Um, so Trent, I'm going to turn it over to you and um, we're going to go right into the, the conversation. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate the introduction. I uh, actually work for Bear out of the little city of Soda Springs, Idaho. I went to Soda Springs 25 years ago, worked there for 10 years, and then got called into the uh, chairman of the school board's office. And I thought, what is this? I'm, I'm in my 40s. I don't answer to school boards anymore, but no. Uh, the chairman of the school board said, hey, I want to know, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? He says, you're pulling the rug out from underneath this community. And I asked him to explain. And he says, your manufacturing operation came here to this little town. You taught, taught all the farmer's kids that you can live the middle class lifestyle and you don't need a college education. And for years, that was the case. The kids of the local farmers here could go and get a job out of the plant and be making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. They could have boats in their yard. They could have snowmobiles. They could be living the middle class lifestyle. And all they really had to do is have a, hard, a strong back, a good work ethic, the ability to go use a shovel. That was all they needed. And now you've stopped hiring that. And you've pulled the rug out from underneath this community. And we have an entire community that does not have a go on mentality. And you're hiring people now from further out of town. Where you're hiring people from Pocatello. My word, you're bringing Utahns up here, by the way, and Mike community of Soda Springs, that's the worst sin possible, <laughs> is to bring Utahns up here. Five years ago, we took the entry-level job at our manufacturing facility in Soda Springs, which was the job of taking a great big iron rod and ramming it into the hole of, a, of an electric arc furnace to open it up so that molten material would flow out of that hole. That's called a tapper. Um, Dirk Kempthorne worked as a tapper at one time, by the way. Tapping, entry-level job. We took that job, we replaced it with a very, very high-end robotic arm with an optical eye on the end of it that can evaluate the heat signature that is behind the metal wall of the electric arc furnace, and it now opens up that hole. We didn't actually reduce headcount because the four tappers that would be on shift to open up that hole were replaced by four electronic technicians. But once again, what that school board chairman chewed me out over was proven correct. Because it was kids just out of high school in Soda Springs could open up a tap hole. But to, to maintain this electric arm, you needed to have some sophistication, some understanding of electronics and why the wiring worked and what programming would make this optical arm work. So that's what I see when we talk about the age of agility, is we actually don't know exactly what skills are gonna be needed, but we do know they're gonna be more sophisticated. They, we do know that it, they're gonna be more thinking jobs. In my opinion, we, we've, we, the day of unskilled labor is rapidly disappearing behind us. And, and every job that we see in the future is going to be somewhat of a knowledge job, and we've got to be prepared for it. But I've seen that personally in what I do over in Soda Springs, and I'm anxious to engage in the conversation today to find out what solutions we have to get us to the future. Thank you.
Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Karen Ashby. I was born in a small town, Ontario, Oregon, just up the road, um, and attended Pioneer Elementary School in the country. Little did I know that my parents, or my parents at the time, that I would need skill sets to one day work at the White House and now um, at a leading edge technology company requiring me to truly be a pioneer. When I look at my daughters today, I don't think it's very different. However, what may differ is how we respond in our education system to the rapidly accelerating pace of the change of innovation and what this could mean for ushering in the next industrial revolution. Let's start with some of this year's milestones, early signals of the accelerating pace of change in a few areas. This past year marks the first time a robot passed a medical exam. Chinese IA, I, excuse me, AI-powered uh, Jiayu took China's medical licensing exam and passed, scoring far above the required threshold to, to pass it. Um, my thunder was stolen a little bit earlier with uh, the auto, um, uh, Uber subsidiary, which uh, was the first time this past year um, that an autonomous truck on an open public road completed a commercial delivery. Advances in autonomous vehicles and robotics now regularly make the news, as well as advances in AI. But we're also entering the era of digital biological convergence, where computers, digital data, and biology all come together. Imagine walking into a meeting and being able to visually see the thoughts of others. This technology exists today. Hard drives can store a lot more data than they could just a few years ago, but they still have nothing on DNA. This past year, a pair of researchers developed a process for storing 214 petabytes of data per gram of DNA. These are just a few of the mind-blowing changes going on. The big question we ask ourselves at HP asks, um, how do we deal with all of this change? More specifically, Dion, our CEO, asked, how do we skate to where the puck will go? So where do we start at HP when trying to figure out the future? We actually don't start with technology. We start with people, and we look at megatrends, the long-term needs and the impact on people. Each year, HP produces an annual megatrends report. And we work across the company to create scenarios of how these trends will impact people and culture, the tools and processes, products, and our customers, and our go-to-market and business models. Rapid urbanization is the first megatrend and represents a major secular shift across the globe. More than 1.5 million people move into the cities now every 10 days. And forecasts indicate we'll have more than 70% of the global population that will be urbanized by 2030. In 1900, approximately 50% of the US population lived on a farm, and today that uh, figure is below 2%. At the same time, as more of the population consolidates into cities, we have population demographics that are changing. By 2025, there will be two times as many people over 65 as there are today. Second, the population is also skewing younger. As Generation Z, uh, those under 22 are now the largest demographic group at 2.6 billion, larger now than the baby boomer generation impacting a reduced labor force. Against the background of increasing urbanization and changing demographics, we've also seen much of the world research a level of hyper-globalization. The world has become dramatically more connected in terms of the flow and data of data and information between people and between devices. So it's now common for a kid in primary school to have digital friends in other countries to see stories about far away times, uh, places in real time. As I shared at the beginning, the rate of innovation itself is accelerating. Everything is becoming smarter, more automated, and increasingly personalized. We've heard about um, Industry 4.0, but we find it helpful to take a quick look back at how we arrived at where we are today for what the next industrial revolution will usher in. I won't take time in the, in, uh, in the interest of time just to go over the first, second, and third industrial revolution as we're living in the third industrial revolution now. Um, but, but what it, it offers is the approach that HP has taken uh, to prepare for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and that is why we as a company have gone into 3D printing. 
Um, it's all about collapsing and digitalizing the supply chain. So fundamentally, it's about changing the way things are designed and made from end to end, and it means designing for additive manufacturing and transforming supply chains. Here's a glimpse from our point of view and next gener generation HP 3D printers that are able to deliver these designs as output on demand. Skill sets that we see needed in the future through public-private partnerships in our education system entail critical thinking, strategy, communication, emotional intelligence, creativity, collaboration, and cognitive flexibility, which will become the most sought after skills. To prepare for that future, we need to emphasize developing high or order thinking and emotional skills. So the bottom line is that automation cannot take away from our humanity. I see a bright future for humans. In fact, I believe that there absolutely will be plenty of challenging work for humans because of AI and not in spite of it. I'm involved in strategic technology advances for a living, but when it comes to creativity and innovation, I'll continue to bet on humans. We'll come through with new ideas, new industries, and new ways to keep ourselves busy and productive, this time as with AI helpers. Our imagination will carry us forward. It always does as pioneers. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Eileen Langen-Barber and I'm CEO, director, and co-founder of Kinetics Inc. And we are a tech company here in Boise, Idaho. And um, we uh, have, well, we had two subsidiaries. I was president of Kinetics till 2005 and we, um, we separated out our companies in 2005 because um, the, uh, for, first off, let me just start with Rod over here. Rod asked a question, or didn't make, ask a question, but he made a statement that with every challenge comes an opportunity. And I found that with every opportunity comes challenges. <laughs> and so both are true, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, so way back when, um, we had ClickBank, that was our tech company we founded in our garage. And then we, um, out of that, we got our first charge back, like, oh my God, what is this? We don't even know what's going on. Um, we then realized we needed to fight fraud in real time. So count with a K, K-O-U-N-T. Um, so I would just wanna give you enough information on myself, so that way you guys can ask me some stump-worthy questions when we're up here as a panel speaker. Um, I am really passionate and involved with women in computer science, trying to get more women in the software developer field, because I feel like there's just not enough women in that field, and it's a really, uh, it's a prestigious field, it's a, it's, it's a field that pays a lot of money and we just don't have enough women. I think the number is about 10, 15%, and I think that more women should be in computer science. So going from um, being in the, the tech sector and then just getting involved as an industry leader on different um, com committees in the art, for me, very fulfilling. Um, I've set up scholarships for women in computer science. Um, I was, and Bert was there too. It, there was a Bert Glandon somewhere here in the audience. We had a lot of educators and industry people at an ITC meeting back in 2011 or 2012, and we're trying to solve um, a, lot of, a lot of different issues. And we brought people as an all day thing, bringing people from all over the, the valley and Idaho. Um, the, and I remember the president from University of Idaho was at that meeting too. So I know we're here in the Treasure Valley, so Boise State always gets all the attention, but and there's a vandal over there. Um, so um, the, uh, that, that, what came out of that day is a bunch of industry leaders stood up and said, we need AP computer science in the high schools um, because I'm doing things at a college level but we see this, that, that AP computer science is only being offered as a elective. Um, so how do we solve these problems to, to get kids to want to take computer science in college? And then how do you get younger kids excited about studying computer science so that they then want to take it in high school? So, you know, getting code.org and um, AP computer science and women studying computer science in college and I see that I got my one minute thing here up. Um, one other thing I wanna say is my background is, I did a degree in chemistry um, from Virginia Tech in 1991 and I never in a million years, I thought I was gonna be a, a chemistry teacher, I never thought I'd be like in the uh, founder and um, on the board of a tech company. So 
It's, I'm excited to hear what we're going to be talking about today, and I um, thank you for including me on this panel. My name is David Tate. I'm the president and CEO of St. Luke's Health System. I came here nine years ago to transform healthcare. And after years of preparation, uh, we started putting this in action last year, January 1st of 2017. And now 36% uh, of our revenue is uh, tied to this new business model. And this transformation is about changing care from fee for service, which you're very familiar with which is every service that you get from a healthcare provider, you get a bill for, to a situation where the health system uh, gets a fixed payment for all of your care inside and outside the health system and has to manage that care and get great outcomes while reducing the cost. And so that's the transformation we're going on. That's changing the workforce uh, because as we move away from uh, fee-for-service where we're just providing services to where we now have a fixed payment for your health care and now if you get complications that's instead of being revenue in the old model it's now cost uh, and, and now in terms of health if we can keep you healthy we save a lot of costs so now the focus is where it ought to be instead of providing ill care trying to make people healthy so it's created new roles for health coaches in our health system also, for those people that are ill, uh, care coordination and care co coordinators to manage that care uh, to improve that. We're also using technology to change the way that people do their jobs. So, for example, if, if St. Luke's were to take risk for everybody in this room's health care, I can tell you that the statistics would predict that 5% of you will account for half of all the health care costs. Uh, consumed by everybody in this room. So now what we are doing is for that 5% where we might have nurses go and do home health visits every week or two to visit the patient. Instead now we're sending them home with iPads and devices that will monitor their health conditions and upload uh, so that we can constantly reevaluate how these patients are doing and make interventions in their health care so that hopefully we can avoid them going to the emergency room, which is very costly, or having to be uh, hospitalized. And in fact, that's what the data shows. When we do that, we reduce ER visits 38%. We reduce um, hospitalizations 56%. Two weeks ago, we opened up a virtual care hospital. So now there's no beds in this facility. It's a, a whole uh, group of, of monitors, and we, have, uh, we can provide ICU care uh, to remote places. Data shows that if you're critically ill, your survival chances are greatly affected by whether you have a board-certified critical care medicine physician taking care of you. We don't have those in places uh, outside of Boise. So what we do is we put them behind monitors and we can remotely monitor a patient using military-grade cameras and uh, work with the nurses at that facility and keep critically ill patients at their local hospital. We're also now bringing specialists to uh, remote sites from Boise so the patient doesn't have to travel from that site uh, to Boise for, to see a specialist. All of this has created a lot more need for uh, IT support and also now the latest, the next wave for us is really a focus on analytics. How can we take all of this information that we've got and translate it into actionable data that helps us improve outcomes and lower the total cost of care. So this is a very exciting time in healthcare. I'm very proud to be leading St. Luke's and I hope to make you proud that we will become the first health system in the country to fix healthcare. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Connors. I'm president and CEO of the local Chamber of Commerce here. I know, I know many of the people in the room. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to come back up here in just a minute, but uh, I'll give you a brief introduction. 
Um, I did want to acknowledge, I think uh, our Lieutenant Governor is in the room. Brad, are you, are you here? Brad, always a good friend of innovation and of economic development in our state. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, like I said, I, I have been here in Boise uh, as long as Dr. Pate. We came in in the class of 09 uh, several years ago, and uh, I moved here from Washington, D.C. I, was a, uh, I ran a trade association in D.C., and before that, I was a high school teacher for 18 years. So uh, I've done the classroom thing, and I didn't think that was an applause line, but I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I, I was a classroom teacher in a rural school district in upstate New York, and I went through the chairs in that district, uh, teacher, guidance counselor, principal, and eventually school administrator. So from that career, I jumped into this nonprofit association management thing, and in D.C., it was sort of an easy gig. I ran a trade association where all my members were exactly alike. They all worked in the same field. So I knew what their big issues were, I knew the kind of work that they did, so it was kind of an easy gig. And then I came here to Boise, Idaho, and became the chamber guy. And if you know chambers of commerce, and I've got 2,000 business members who are members of the Boise Chamber, and the J.R. Simplot Company is a member of mine, Micron Technology is a member of mine, but so is Main Street Deli, two blocks over here, so is Mr. Allen, our photographer over here, which is one of my brand new uh, chamber members, a sole proprietor. So it's a diverse group of businesses that uh, we represent. And when I took the job, I said, how am I going to appeal to the deli and the J.R. Simplot Company? So you ask questions. What's important to your business? And in, over the last couple of years, what has been universally important to the small business and to the global company has been this issue of, I can't find the right people. It's been workforce issues. And we deal in economic development a lot, and it's all about workforce right at the moment. So Rod, thank you for inviting me to this age of agility. When you called me up and said, I'd like you to moderate a panel on the age of agility, I said, well, I'm more an uh, age of an Aquarius kind of guy. <laughs> See, now the people who didn't get that, you young people. <laughs> this, this room just aged itself big time. So, uh, could I have the uh, panelists come on back up here and uh, we're going to ask a few questions. I've got a few pat questions, but then we're going to collect those cards from you and I'll sort of vet those as we go along here. So please, a hand one more time for our panelists. <clears throat> so I have uh, four sort of prepared questions uh, around this topic, and I, I'll, I'll sort of read them all off at, at first so you can kind of think about answers, but I'm gonna to go to each one of you with each one of these questions. Uh, first of all, think about in your particular companies, your, your roles, the impact of automation and artificial intelligence on your company. Secondly, what are your demands for an educated workforce? Thirdly, what kind of soft skills, and are soft skills important to your company, and if so, what kind? And then finally, kind of wrapping it up, the question will be, how would you rethink and reshape our education system to meet those particular needs of your company. So with that, let's start off with the first question, and how is automation, how is AI impacting your particular world? Uh, and we'll start over here with Karen. Um, so AI is huge at HP. Um, we talk about it quite frequently. Um, you know, definitely when it comes to 3D printing and um, really getting in front of the wave that we see um, as this six trillion dollar economy. Um, so I think um, you know, as we are looking at our R and D, it's a it's a big part of um, what we what we talk about on a daily basis. Thank you, David. 
So uh, relative to healthcare, uh, unfortunately, we've lagged behind most all industries uh, with as far as automation and uh, AI. Uh, the productivity uh, in healthcare has hardly changed at all over the uh, recent de decades, uh, but it's coming, and there's a, a lot more. Uh, we've seen uh, some of this with the implementation of our electronic health record and voice uh, recognition software. We now no longer need transcriptionists, uh, so that's kind of changed that. Um, I think that uh, we're really on the brink of uh, big impacts in AI. Uh, so far, some of the early impacts of AI and healthcare have been actually pretty disappointing, uh, but I think there's some uh, real promise I think that uh, some real opportunities, for example, we're now starting to see that uh, AI can uh, better diagnose a skin cancer than a dermatologist. So we may be using uh, more of that to help identify for the dermatologist who ought to be biopsied. Uh, we're finding that uh, AI uh, can screen large numbers of mammograms, uh, sort out the normal uh, from the abnormal, and then we can have a, a, a radiologist that specializes this focus just on the ones that uh, have been flagged by the uh, computer. So I think we'll see a lot more in healthcare, but so far it's been rather disappointing. So the um, at count that fights fraud in real time is, is used, um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> but the I think the word AI scares a lot of people because they think like, oh my gosh, everything's AI and are human beings even necessary? <laughs> um, so the, the thing to think about with AI is it takes people to be writing the code and interacting to improve the software constantly. We're always having to stay one, two, three steps ahead of the crooks that are out there constantly trying to um, uh, steal from companies. So yeah, so count does real-time fraud control. So. so my company has the luxury of having at one time ha held as its a wholly owned division Fisher Controls, uh, the first company that came out with uh, computer integrated manufacturing. And uh, our facilities here in Idaho, by the way, were the only the second facility in the nation to be run completely through computer integrated manufacturing. I'll tell you where our challenge is, and that's being at the what I call the bleeding edge of AI. Um, we, we have, we've been data logging for three decades now. We know under every circumstance what a real world operator did. So we can go back and take the data log and try to convert that into artificial intelligence. Because we got three decades of this is what real people did, so now maybe the computer could do the same thing. Well, the first thing we found out is we're not that smart yet. And we, we had the computer doing something that was odd. It was adjusting the temperature of a kiln in a wrong way. And finally, it took a 35-year operator, old crusty guy who came in and said, oh, that's when the wind blows from the north. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was just a little something like that. The, the data logger didn't catch. And so the AI was doing something wrong. And that's one of the challenges is, is, is AI is something that is a trend of the future, but it requires that we, we, we be well interfaced with all of these folks that have been doing it manually forever. Because they're the ones who really know what's going on. And the conversion to AI is potentially an awkward one if we're not talking with the people who've been doing the real work all this time. Trent, why don't you hold on to that mic? Um, and, and before I ask the next question, remember, if you've got specific questions, uh, we have runners around the room, and we'll ask those uh, uh, as we finish up these uh, first four questions. Uh, the next question, again, is about education, and it, it really is, uh, what do you see as a demand for higher ed, a uh, college degree, a high school degree? Are there jobs in your worlds that, that require a variety of skill sets? Uh, what do you see, at, what are you looking for right now? Uh, and I know you're all representing pretty big companies, uh, so it's probably all over the map, but if you can kind of uh, get that into a granular, what are you looking for in the skill set in terms of what kind of educational preparation do you want? Trent. Well, I describe it as, and I hated this in, in math school, uh, but doing derivatives, what we really need to do is take the educational programs of the past and figure out how to now teach the derivatives of that because 
we're no longer going to say, you're gonna go into this career and the a procedure will be A, B, C, D, and E. And that's what you'll do for the rest of your life is A, B, C, D, and E. Because that's just not the world we're living in anymore. The A, B, C, D, and E that I teach today will be wrong next year. So what we've got to do is we've got to help our current students have the intuition and the logic and the problem solving skills so that they know why A, B, C, D, and E existed. And because the circumstances are different next year, they know that this, the tasks involved in that job are going to be different and how they need to be different to adapt to the new condition next year. And that, that is actually, that requires quite a bit of more understanding of kind of the background, why it is we do things. Um, and and it's, certainly it's an educational challenge that is a raised bar for us all across the board. So um, I, I feel like the, the and I think if I remember the other questions, I don't, I'm worried it might blur a little bit the other questions too. The, the basic of going and getting a college degree and learning, it's, it's still important. It's, I mean, you're learning to learn, you're learning to problem solve, you're learning to analyze, you're learning to think, and to communicate. You have to have writing skills, you have to be able to communicate. So those things don't go away. I was not prepared to have a, career in the internet, because the internet did not really exist commercially. Well, it didn't exist commercially at all when I graduated. Um, I don't know if I want to say the year that I graduated. But it did, it did exist um, between you know, government institutions and um, some universities, a couple of universities. But um, I think having the tools and uh, getting just kids excited about I get, well, we're talking about agility, just having them know that they just need to be prepared for anything. And so the basics, like I said, problem solving, analyzing, thinking, and being curious. So those things should not go away from what, no matter what you're studying. David? So uh, at, at St. Luke's, we have a disproportionate number of employees that have to have advanced degrees. Uh, and I don't see that changing uh, much. What we're looking for is lifetime learners because things are changing so fast in healthcare that uh, we need people that are uh, going to um, seek to continue to learn. Uh, with uh, our leaders, we're looking for new skills uh, along things like change management, project management, lean, uh, things that are gonna help us um, actually navigate through all this change. And uh, for physicians, uh, it's really changing dramatically. Uh, when I was in medical school and taught um, uh, to practice, uh, we never interacted uh, with any other healthcare professionals. Uh, we were uh, just taught we're the boss, we would give the orders and everybody would do what we say. That's not the world today. The today, it's team-based care. It's uh, at working together with other healthcare professionals to, um, to take care of patients. And so we're working with the schools to promote uh, training uh, physicians to be in that kind of environment rather than the authoritarian type of environment they used to be in. Uh, definitely lifelong lear learners as well. Um, engineering skill sets obviously have been very traditional, but as our supply chain uh, becomes more condensed, as we look at getting in front of really AI, 3D printing, um, and where technology is going, soft skills um, and problem solving. So it's not what people know, it's more of how, how they are thinking about problem solving. So um, I would echo um, just, uh, you know, uh, the creativity, the... Um, critical thinking. Um, we have a program that's going on right now that um, HP is really um, focused on snatching interns, you know, straight out of college. And so um, investing, um, investing early on. Um, and uh, again, you know, it's, it's uh, how they're problem solving and how they're thinking about um, approaching an agile world. Thanks. And uh, Karen mentioned soft skills, and that's kind of my next question. Um, and this is an issue that, I, that comes up small businesses, big businesses. What are you all looking for in terms of soft skills? And everybody has a different definition of what that is. But what are you looking for from, from future or, or employees? And how do you screen those soft skills when you're looking at new candidates? Um, 
Why don't you, why don't you go ahead, uh, sure. Karen? Um, so I think I mentioned a bit of it as far as, you know, uh, some of the initial programs that we have very focused on um, uh, our investing in our interns. Um, you know, it's, it's nice that we get a dry run <laughs> with the interns a lot of times. Um, and so uh, that's been, you know, a, a major focus as far as screening and um, just really on the job type of, of work. Um, I think it, it, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit on one of the other topics and speak a little bit about digital education and um, the potential that we see there um, in really continuing to transform our, our workforce um, and to uh, look at how dig digital education can, can um, help create uh, and invest in some of the soft skills that we're looking at. So uh, as far as measuring uh, soft skills, I would tell you that we do a lousy job. And if somebody has figured out how to do that uh, better, I hope you'll contact me. Uh, we try to identify it on uh, interviewing and references, uh, but we're lousy at it. Uh, and when I think about uh, the issues, uh, the problem issues that we've had with leaders or physicians, uh, rarely, in fact, I'm having trouble thinking of a single instance, is it an issue that the person wasn't competent, wasn't properly trained or educated or had the skills and so forth. It's, it's almost always soft skills. And so uh, ability to communicate, ability to hold other people accountable, ability to hold themselves accountable, uh, ability to work in teams, uh, ability to inspire others uh, on their team, all, all these kinds of, of soft skills, that's usually why they fail. So um, I haven't had to do any hiring or firing since 2005, <laughs> but I will say back in the day when I was hiring every employee of Kinetics, I always looked for people that um, that they 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 could be trained and they had a great attitude and it's because we had and we we have people at all levels from software developers to customer service but a lot of our stuff was it was all built in house so they didn't have to come with a specific skill set they had to know how to turn on a computer back in 1998 but um, we could train them so just finding people that are that have the right attitude was at least way back then. Um, what, what you look for. Because someone that has like all the skills, but you could, but they're gonna be a difficult personality, that's, that's a soft skill. Um, so I think hiring a really good HR manager, VP of HR, that can continue, that continues that. And we got lucky at Kinetics where we have amazing um, talent looking for additional talent out there. So it's just, maybe it's just been dumb luck, I don't know. <laughs> Of all the soft skills, the lack of which would be barriers to succeed, success in our workforce, um, the, one, the phrase that I think captures it best is, it's not what I know or don't know, it's what I know that ain't so. And, and, what, and, and really what we're talking about is the soft skill of being open to the idea that someone else's different point of view may have value as well. That's, and, and, and my concern, by the way, is just ask yourself, in what direction are we going as a society? Are we, are we, I mean, I'm not sure that that soft skill is something that we're right now fostering and encouraging more of, um, but it's absolutely critical. In our work environment, if you do not take the observation of your coworker that may very much disagree with what you think, and and say to yourself, well, there, I'm going to assume there may be some validity to that. It may be your life on the line. That, I mean, that's the kind of work environment we have, is, is that feedback coming from someone else may be a risk or a threat that you don't see. And, and it's absolutely essential to have that kind of open-mindedness and ability to work as a team and give other human beings the respect to say, maybe I disagree, but I'm going to listen to what you have to say. Thanks, Trent. And, and let's kind of bring all of those discussions to a head here and talk about what we're really here to talk about is how can our current education system, whether it's K-12, whether it's post-secondary, how can they address all of the issues that you've brought up, whether it's soft skills or, or hard skills? Uh, what suggestions do you have? Who's doing a good job at it? What should we be doing different? And I'll, I'll start right with you, 
Trent? Well, I think we're beginning to see all across the board that the, the, the solution is to take the theoretical, give kids a good basis in why, but then let them see the real world. And that can happen through work-based learning opportunities. It can happen through more field trips. It can happen through the art of, uh, of bringing video into classrooms and allowing uh, communication. But, but the, the final end goal needs to start be ground-truthing the, the, the world that we just started, just described here by giving kids some experience with that real world and, and supplementing the classroom teaching with that real world experience. So um, for me, I'm trying, I'm, just, I'm, I'm struggling here because I want to answer from like when I was a high school student, how I got turned off to computer science. <laughs> I, I was I took a computer science class because I was, just felt like I was a nerd in the 80s and um, but it was for Trayan and Pascal and it was awful and then for fun a couple years ago I took some computer science classes at Boise State just for fun and when I finally got to the part where um, it was C because I started with Java and I loved it and it was C if I had just been introduced to C back in high school then um, I was like I think I would have stuck with it because it's a it's a a version of Java, an earlier version. Java is more the higher level language, so it's a little bit easier than C. But you just want to make sure you're exposing kids to the right things. And um, at a high school level, I know I keep harping on the computer science stuff. It's because I also feel like even if kids aren't going to go out there and and learn to program, there's still um, blocks of of skills that they can learn to do the logic part of it and to appreciate what um, software developers are are going through. Um, and then, um, and then I'm going to answer the, the question in a completely different way as far as education, where we're going. Um, my kids, when they were in high school, um, my daughter took calculus as a senior. My son's two years younger, but he then took calculus as a junior. And the calculus teacher taught it the way she always taught it. And I mean, she's an amazing calculus teacher. that's was at Boise High. And then the next year when Landon took it, um, she's, and she had to like calm down a lot of parents on back to school night. She's like, she did a flip classroom um, where she, the kids had to watch her lecture um, on, I don't know if she had on YouTube or how they're watching it even, but there's, you know, it's all, it's like the, new, the wave of the future. Um, and then they'd come into class the next day and they would work on all the problems. And it seemed mind blowing, like to, wow, we're going, we're going this way. And she's like, if it doesn't work, we're gonna switch back to the way we've always done it but I want to give this a try. And it worked, and both my kids did awesome in calculus. Um, and my son's graduating, by the way, so maybe I should be talking to <laughs> you at HP. Um, so um, I, I, I feel like part of the education system, we always feel like everything moves at a snail's pace, and it's just like no change can happen, but I've actually seen a lot of good changes happen in the last five, six years, so. Thanks, David. Uh, you know, I think that there are going to be significant changes. It, it used to be uh, for in our industry that uh, the key to getting a job was that you had a certain uh, certificate or degree. Uh, I think that's going to be less important in the future. I think the, as I said earlier about the lifelong uh, learning, uh, I think what we need is restructured relationships with schools instead of it being around an episode of, of education, like a four-year degree, that, <clears throat> that it's actually uh, lifelong that these students uh, stay with you and come back and take uh, courses. I know uh, we're revamping um, our enterprise uh, project management office at St. Luke's and think that's a critical part of our uh, strategy, uh, but few of our leaders are uh, prepared uh, for that and educated, and, and how nice that would be to just go back and take uh, certain classes uh, in this and get trained for um, uh, these, these new roles. So I think that kind of lifelong education. Uh, the same thing uh, we find with uh, clinicians. We make a huge mistake in uh, healthcare and do it over and over again by we take our, our best clinicians and then we put them in leadership positions and think they'll be great leaders uh, when we fail to recognize those are com 
two completely different skills. And in fact, uh, if you were trained as a physician, you've actually been trained the wrong way to be a leader. And so we need uh, more education to be help, able to help pre uh, prepare these folks to be leaders as they advance in their career. And seldom uh, can that be going back and taking a two or three year uh, program. It's got to be more tailored uh, education to help these people grow into these uh, positions. So I think that's kind of the future. So as we look at getting in front of this AI wave, um, really it's through public-private partnerships and having these types of conversations, um, I think. Um, that's how we can really um, you know, start to, I think, develop and manifest more of the skill sets that, um, that we're looking for um, in the soft skill space in particular. So again, you know, going back to storytelling and sales and problem solving. Um, those types of, of things. Um, again, I mentioned the digital education, um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity there when we look at big data and the infrastructure and standardizing um, some of the digital education space there, um, making more opportunity available for people um, to, to um, learn online as well. So, Thank you. So I've got a few questions from the audience here, and, and some are sort of redundant, so I'll try to... Uh, uh, make them overlap a little bit. Uh, one is, is a classic education question. Um, what do you think is more important for schools to produce specific skills or soft skills? In other words, test scores versus interpersonal skills. Where is everybody on that spectrum? We'll, we'll start with you. Yeah. So soft skills is... Soft skills versus hard skills, yeah, test that's... scores versus portfolios of work. Yeah, I think that's been absolutely at the crux of a lot of our conversation here today and where we see the industry going. Um, you know, I, again, as, as we go back to consolidating um, the supply chain and um, how we look at the 3D um, technology, and in particular in printing, which by the way, there was an exciting announcement yesterday, which was perfect timing for this um, seminar in that um, uh, HP is now into metal 3D printing, uh, 3D uh, printing as well. But, um, but back to you know, the soft skills aspect of um, what we're looking for, again, we are, are very much focused on um, the get a, you know focus on on bringing in students early on um, and having some trial um, practice at um, being on the job and figuring out um, are they problem solving in the way um, in a creative approach that that we need to. Uh, I think it's a false dichotomy uh, because first of all I can't hire somebody. Uh, into uh, uh, most of our professional roles unless they have uh, the qualifications and the basic education and knowledge of their, their area. But if I hire them and they don't have the soft skills, they're not going to be successful. So uh, what we really need to do is both and figure out a way that our educational institutions can do both. Um, and then the question about hard skills and test taking, I mean, there, there needs to be some balance. I just know, I just spent a, a girls weekend with my high school girlfriends this past weekend. I went, um, flew to Virginia, I actually flew through Denver last night. It might've been on the same flight. <laughs> um, my luggage didn't arrive, but I think maybe it's at my house by now, hopefully. But um, anyways, my kids just, my daughter graduated college. She's, she has a degree in computer science, my son's um, economics. But I just spent my weekend with girlfriends and they all have high school kids and they're all stressed out for their kids. And so we spend a lot of time, and I'm, and I'm basically trying to help them go through this, be like, um, just try to get them to think, like, they're going to be okay. And I can give them a bunch of different stories about other people that I know that, that didn't have a clear path to college, that they, you know, meandered and had their own journey. But I think there's just so much stress on test taking. Um, and I just remember back when I applied back in the 80s, it's just, I think I typed up my application on a brother typewriter and sent it off to, I think I applied to two or three schools. It just wasn't a big deal. And the pressure nowadays, um, it's, it's pretty intense. And maybe that's just an East Coast thing. I was, I was, it was the Washington DC area is where I went to school. I don't know if it's the same here in Idaho, but um, I've been living here in Idaho since 99, so maybe I should know that, but maybe it's just because I didn't put the same stress. I just told my kids, you're going, but that's it. And then let them figure out where they want to go. 
Um, but the, yeah, so it's a combination of both. I mean, you have to um, be able to problem solve and think, and you have to have the soft skills too. But I don't know how to make that uh, journey like less stressful for, for kids and parents. I don't know who's stressing out more in this situation. Well, soft skills is so poorly defined. Um, if, if you use it to mean all of those underlying core values, like, you know, why do I answer this? Well, because honesty is a core value of mine. That's what I mean when I say we need to refocus on the derivative knowledge. I mean, honesty being a core value should be derivative. I mean, that, and then we build on it. And if we've got that core value, we're good. Now, having said that, I think in general, Dr. Pate hit it right on the head. The dichotomy is false. I just think I have friends that I, a range of friends, many of whom I might call in to pick me up at the bottom of my white water, water run. Some of them I would give an A to their, my ability to rely on them to pick me up. <laughs> Some of them I would give a C or a D to. And my guess is there would be a strong correlation with their ability to turn in English assignments and do math quizzes too. <laughs> so, so much of those interpersonal skills are directly tied to core personality traits and, and transfer across into their academics as well. Yeah, and if I, I can put my own two cents in on this as a former educator, the, the, this balance question I think is critical. Um, you know, we used to see the high school down the street from us would, would post higher SAT scores and brag about it and how they were so much better than us. Well, they only tested 2% of their kids. If you're only going to test the top 2% of your kids, of course your scores are going to be higher. That's one of the reasons I, I like what Ed, Idaho does, and every single kid is paid to take the SAT. So, so we're not putting just the good kids in. It, it's everybody. Um, the, other, the other thing that I worried about is that when I was a guidance counselor, you used to see a lot of the colleges moving toward, well, we're not going to do SATs anymore, you know, kind of getting away from the, the whole standardized testing uh, and relying more on, on classroom grades. That's great, but, you know, I taught in high school, and I knew Mr., I won't say his name, the science teacher, was never going to give any kid, I don't care how good they were, better than a C because nobody was as good as his standard. And that poor kid would always get their, their grade point average hurt. So people avoided taking science. And that's no way to run a railroad either. So this balance thing, I think, is, is critical in education. Uh, I've got one a little bit different question here. And this is about the, the fact that uh, you know, most employers are, are dying for good people. Uh, this question asks about individuals with disabilities. Uh, are they an untapped talent pool? And let me just expand that a little bit. Are there non-traditional kinds of folks, whether they're seniors, veterans, you, you name it, that are an untapped labor pool here and in any of your companies? Have you got anything creative going on around that particular metric? And I'll start over here with Karen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I uh, have been um, very impressed with HP as far as uh, the focus on diversity, just in general. Um, and as our speaker earlier today, you know, defining diversity, um, it is in all shapes, thoughts, forms, and um, there's just a tremendous, it's a core value, I'd say, of the company. So um, there's, there's um, a, 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 every uh, meeting that I sit in, I'll look around the table and just really, truly be grateful for the diverse thoughts uh, that come from different, different perspectives and backgrounds. So, yeah. Uh, being in healthcare, we certainly uh, promote a lot of uh, hiring of dis people with disabilities, uh, and they turn out to be fantastic employees for us. Uh, we also uh, utilize a lot of um, uh, older individuals who maybe have completed their careers and they serve as volunteers for us, and it's a huge uh, part of our uh, operations to have these uh, uh, volunteers. I, I think the big untapped uh, area is particularly the veterans. Uh, and I've been doing some work with some veterans groups to uh, try to help uh, uh, these individuals position themselves better uh, for positions um, uh, in our industry. Uh, because I find that veterans, um, they, they do learn a lot about uh, leadership in the military, and they're really great employees for us. So, I mean, I know, uh, I mean, we're a small company. We only, well, Kinetics is now just ClickBank, as counts its own company. It's uh, 
flown the coop, so to speak. But um, so we're only 100 people. But I do know that we've accommodated and we have people and, you know, that we've had um, people in wheelchairs. And um, but to me, when I think of disability, I actually think more of learning disability. And I think that the um, 30, 40 years ago, if, if you felt like your child had a uh, was not learning correctly, and this happened to my older sister, and it didn't even get diagnosed until she was almost in high school, that she did have auditory dyslexia. So, I, I mean, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm sure that a lot of our employees, and this goes to, because um, the software developer, you know, just the, kind of that techie, geeky mind, I think that they think about things differently, and, and I wouldn't be um, at all surprised to learn that a lot of them maybe even have ADHD or ADD, you know, all these things that are now, we have so much more knowledge and awareness of, um, and I think that educators do a lot better job at recognizing that and getting help for kids when they're younger, you know, when they're young to get them the um, proper coping skills and mechanism. The good news here is also the bad news. Because the bad news is we're still held back by biases that assume certain people can't do certain things. That's the bad news. But if you think about it, that's the good news. The good news is, is that that reservoir of talent is out there ready to be tapped with just a mind shift. I mean, just a, just a simple little mind shift, and it's there. And so that's why I say it's also the good news, because if we can just all of a sudden convert ourselves from they can't do this to, yeah, they can do this, then all of a sudden that talent pool is just right there and available. And, and I want to give a call out to vocational rehab here in the state of Idaho. They consistently, here in Idaho, rate among the best in the nation for creating pathways of opportunity for individuals with disabilities. And, and I think we need to continue that tradition in the state. Great. Thanks. We, we have time, I think, for one more round of questions. And I have two, two kind of similar questions here from the audience, and it's about high school interns. And I know, and part of, part of this question says, love to have more of them, but we're concerned about insurance risks. We're concerned about the regulatory environment. And that is an issue, and it's an issue we at the Chamber have been talking uh, to the Department of Labor about and, and some of the regulatory issues that sort of make it uh, in, a, in an effort to do the right thing, sometimes it's the wrong thing, uh, make it so restrictive nobody wants to do this kind of thing. But uh, anything creative going on in terms of internships with your companies that you'd like to talk about? And let me start back with Trent. Um, well, first of all, let me address the underlying question about risk, and that is, um, uh, this is, this is what we've discovered. A drug-free 16-year-old is less of a risk than a not-so-drug-free 28-year-old. Um, and and, <laughs> and that's, the, that's the reality of the modern workplace, is, is uh, we, we need to, uh, focus on the fact that the actuarial tables that the insurance companies are using may not reflect all of the facts, all the risk factors. And so, so if we can engage with our high schools, uh, uh, the company I work for, we have regularly invited um, college-bound uh, high school seniors to come in and do our summer relief work. Uh, and they get familiarity with our operations, and there's a great rate of them then coming it back and being the applicants for jobs at our facility. So it, it's a very successful model. Eileen? Um, I'm not aware of Kinetics or ClickBank or Count having high school interns. I know we definitely um, engage in c with college students. I mean, we're also just a s small company between Kinetics and Count, I mean, 250 employees. Um, so, but I do know that some of the high school computer science teachers that are in the Valley have contacted Count and ClickBank to kind of show them like what tech companies look like, but they'll do a field trip and they'll take their high school students that are learning um, computer science to um, some really cool tech companies because there's a lot of them right here in the downtown area. Um, I think they just want these high school students to see this is what you can be doing um, as, a, as a possible career. So we do engage with high school students in that way. Good. Uh, the challenge for St. Luke's is uh, we're a teaching organization, so uh, we have nursing students, nurse practitioner students, therapy students, medical students, residents, uh, and uh, all of these people need somebody to supervise them. Uh, 
uh, in addition to doing their day jobs. And so that's the real challenge is we uh, try to, uh, we work very hard to try to accommodate all of the uh, students that have to do uh, internships or rotations or clerkships uh, as part of their education and make that our priority. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not a lot left uh, after that. We do offer high school students the opportunity to volunteer, but we don't have uh, particular internships. So at HP, we get to bring our kids to work with us. So I think that that's um, a treat. And my daughters don't have much of a choice but to learn about coding at a young age. So um, science and technology um, in general. So um, I think as far as high school um, programs that we have going on, there is uh, hackathons. There's, there's different public uh, programs where HP does reach out. Um, so that uh, they're engaging. Of course, we, we always um, offer um, any kind of a tour to different high school um, programs to come in and, and take you through the facilities um, that just out here in, in Boise, um, or Eagle, rather. So um, the other thing, as far as the intern program um, itself, what I would say for graduate and um, undergraduate, we do have a, an intern fair, which is very exciting in that we have some of the best and brightest ideas come out. We just had this uh, this take place recently where um, they all have a chance to, to present whatever project they've been working on um, before the leadership team. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, we'll, we'll host a fair. And so the entire campus goes through and listens and learns to uh, the different projects that they work on, so. Great, thank you. Uh, at this point, I just wanna say thank you to Rod and IBE for bringing the business community together with the education community. We need to do that a lot more around here. Uh, so please join me in thanking our great panelists here today. Thank you.